This program is brought to you by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies. This lecture is one in a series exploring the message of the Book of Mormon and its invitation to everyone to come unto Christ. The speaker is James Falconer. The title of this lecture is How to Study the Book of Mormon. In the early 70s, I was a graduate student at Penn State University and I worked for a professor named Stephen Goldman. Professor Goldman not only taught the philosophy of science, he also was a part-time rabbi in a nearby community. It was a small community with a Jewish congregation that didn't have enough money to hire a rabbi, and so much as a Mormon bishop would do, Professor Goldman acted as their rabbi. I was very intrigued by this. <coughs> Professor Goldman and I became friends as I worked with him, and so I went to Professor Goldman at one point and said, but I'd like to take a readings class with him. I'd like to study the Old Testament with him. We talked for a while, and he said that I should come and propose a course of study for a readings course the next quarter. I came, and I brought a suggestion that he and I study Genesis together. He laughed a little bit and said, well, how much of Genesis did you want to do? And I suggested we do all of it. He said, well, uh, I suggest we do only the first uh, chapter. I laughed and said, why don't we just agree to do as much as we possibly can? He said we could do that if I would come in the next time. We would have lunch together once a week, and I would come the next time. He would uh, discuss it with me if I would bring my questions. So I made up a list of questions. I brought them to Professor Goldman. We had lunch. As we were eating lunch, he asked me to read the questions, and then was absolutely disgusted with my questions when I read them. They were things like, how does the Bible uh, correlate with uh, evolution? What can we say about... Uh, uh, this, that, or the other aspect of some abstruse idea. <clears throat> he asked me why I didn't take my religion seriously, and I was embarrassed. It was clear that he th was thinking quite differently than I was. In turn, he said, instead of your questions, let's ask mine. And he asked his questions, which were always about details of the text. What does this word mean? Why is this event before that event? What are we doing here? What is the Lord saying here? How is he saying what he says? And I couldn't answer any of his questions. I went away very humbled. I w had thought to come and uh, have some sort of high-level discussion with this, uh, this rabbi, and instead I'd been humiliated and shown that I really didn't know very much about what I was talking about. I came back the next week, though, <coughs> with different kinds of questions, questions about the text itself, about the words, about the ideas, about how things related to each other and began to talk with Professor Goldman, and as we talked, I was shocked to discover that this man knew a great deal about the gospel that I thought only the Latter-day Saints knew. We talked, he was also shocked, because he discovered that we knew many things that he thought only Jews knew. These things came out, however, by a careful reading of this book. We made it, it through the quarter, we made it all the way to the end of chapter 3 of Genesis. He felt we'd run at a breakneck speed, I thought we'd gone very slowly, but I'd learned a great deal. Mostly what I'd learned, however, wasn't the, uh, this thing or that matter about Genesis. It was I'd learned much more about how to read the scriptures, about reading carefully and closely. A year or so later, I discovered a, uh, a motto. It was the medieval alchemist motto. Alchemists were people who uh, thought during the medieval period that they would be able to find a method for changing lead into gold or other elements into gold. <coughs> Excuse me. Obviously, if you have uh, such a procedure and you don't let everyone have it, you could become quite wealthy. And this was the goal of alchemy, was to find a way of making something into gold, getting rich, uh, supplying money for the endeavors that you wanted to support. Their motto, though, was lege, 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 labore, ora, et relege. Read, 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 work, pray, and reread. Now, in the church, most of us are pretty well acquainted with some of the elements of this procedure. Most of us know how to read. Those of us who follow the admission of the prophet, read, read, read. We also pray, and presumably those who study pray over what they study. But I'm not, I, I don't think that that many of us, as many as should, do the work that's required. And so I've written that alchemist motto in the front of my Bible to remind me of the things that I should do to turn the leaden things in my life into gold through the scriptures. And I'd like to focus today for a few minutes on this issue of work, how to work at studying the scriptures. I'd like to do th two things to do that. First of all, I'd like to give some suggestions, some general suggestions for scripture study. 
And then I'd like to take a particular look at Mosiah 4 and show you the kinds of things that a careful and uh, slow reading of Mosiah 4 can do for us. The first thing to consider when doing a, <coughs> a careful reading is, is perhaps context. The prophet Joseph Smith said, I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire, what was the question which drew out the answer or caused Jesus to utter the parable? To ascertain its meaning, we must dig up the root and ascertain what it was that drew the saying out of Jesus. We take a look then at what context is being, uh, this is set in. We take a look at what we're doing. We say, what's going on? If we take a look, for example, at Alma 32, when we talk about Alma 32 in our uh, Sunday school classes, in our sacrament talks, we often talk as if Alma 32 dropped out of the sky, as if it doesn't matter to whom Alma was speaking or why he said the things that he did. But if I, I believe very strongly, if we go back and reread Alma 32 in the context of Alma 31, Alma 34, Alma 33, and we see that the sermon Alma is delivering, delivering is delivered to a certain group of people who have a particular question, and we see his, his preaching in the context of that question. We see the degree, for example, that it doesn't answer the question they initially ask, and so at the beginning of chapter 33, they re-ask. They say, what can we do? And then he answers their question when he talks to them about the scriptures. When we see these things, Alma 32 takes on a very different kind of character. It becomes more meaningful to us. In addition to context, <coughs> we need to know the meanings of the words we read. Now, that sounds quite obvious. We need to know the alternative meanings. That's perhaps less obvious. I think, however, in both cases, it's, we often think we know what we're reading, and we don't. I think the best example of this is... Uh, in Doctrine and Covenants 121. We're told that we should reprove betimes with sharpness. If you stop, though, and ask people, what does the word betimes mean? More often than not, they will say something like, once in a while. However, there, there are ways of finding out that that's not the case. What it really means is early. One way to do that is to use a dictionary. If we were to look up betimes, for example, in an historical dictionary like the Oxford English Dictionary, it may, you may not find it in a standard uh, desk dictionary, but if you look it up in an, a historical dictionary, you'll find it means early. If you don't have an historical dictionary handy, were you to use a concordance and look up the number of times that, that the word betimes occurs in the scriptures, you'll see it used in context, it means early. For example, in Genesis 2631, it says, they rose up at times in the morning. The other four uses in, in the Old Testament also suggest that this must mean early. This is another key, I think, to understanding what it means to study the Scripture and how to do it. When we read Scripture, it's often very important to ask ourselves what kinds of scriptural texts were available to the prophet who's writing or speaking at the time that we're reading. We're going to be looking at Mosiah 4. We might wonder, where does, Mosiah, where does King Benjamin's language come from? Does it come from nowhere? It presumably comes from the brass plates, most of which we have in the Old Testament. We have this record then that we can refer to to see the kinds of scriptural language, the kinds of scriptural ideas that King Benjamin is using to help us understand better his, his thoughts. So we might very well look up the, the, the words as they were used in the Old Testament passages to which he had access. We also need to understand how various words in the scriptures connect to each other. Words like and and therefore. We often overlook these, but those words will help us see the ways in which the ideas that scriptures give hook up to one another. For example, in Romans 12 and 1. In the Greek text, the very first of the uh, words used is therefore. It's not quite the first word in the uh, English, but it's the word that connects a chapter 12 to all the rest of those chapters, the first 11 chapters. Many who are not Latter-day Saints find a number of beliefs in Romans that may be difficult for us, that we may have a difficult time understanding, and that we're fairly convinced they have some difficulty understanding. Namely, they find a belief in salvation by grace alone. We too believe in salvation by grace alone, but we also believe that this is connected to the necessity of works. And this word, therefore, at the beginning of chapter 12, helps us understand that. Paul, having explained in great detail the necessity of, of relying upon grace for our salvation, then turns in chapter 12 to say, therefore, you must present your bodies an acceptable sacrifice. 
you must obey the commandments. Your obedience is required of you because the Lord has sacrificed himself for you, so you must sacrifice yourself for him, and the sacrifice that's required is obedience. If we see that word, then we begin to understand much more clearly that grace and works are not uh, opposed to each other in the way that we often think. Finally, I think the important thing for us to do as we read is to ask questions. But we shouldn't start our questions by asking about broad doctrinal issues. Our first question should be about the book, about what the words of the, of the, of the books that we read say. Not questions about, you know, what is this doctrine, but questions about what does this word mean, what is the context, uh, where has this prophet uh, spoken before? What kinds of things has this prophet said? How did the people who heard the prophet re respond? What kind of speech am I reading? Is this a story? Is it a sermon? Is it an historical narrative? Is it a psalm? These kinds of questions will help me begin to understand. With that brief background, let's take a look at Mosiah 4, 6 through, uh, Mosiah 4. And I'd like especially to take a look at Mosiah 4, 6 through 10. When we take a look at this chapter, if we look at Mosiah 4, 6 through 10, we often will discover that there are problematic ideas in here. There are things that may bother us. Let me read you one or two. Mosiah says, I say unto you, if ye have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God, this is verse 6, and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience, and his long suffering towards the children of men, and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world, that thereby salvation might come to him that should put his trust in the Lord, and should be diligent in keeping his commandments, and continue in the faith even unto the end of his life, I mean the life of the mortal body. I say that this is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, whichever were since the fall of Adam, or who are, or whoever shall be, even unto the end of the world. And this is the means whereby salvation cometh. There is none other salvation save this which hath been spoken of. Neither are there any conditions whereby man can be saved except the conditions which I have told you. Believe in God. Believe that he is. That he created all things, both in heaven and earth. Believe that he has all power, and all, he has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that man doth not comprehend all the things which the Lord can comprehend. And again, believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourselves before God and ask in sincerity that he would forgive you. Now, if you believe all these things, see that you do them. There are people who are bothered by this <clears throat> when they read these scriptures because they're bothered by the fact that Mosiah seems to be so negative about the people he's speaking to, about human potential. He seems, uh, they think, to be putting them down. What I'd like to do is to take a look at these verses as, as we talk in a context, taking a look at particular words, try to understand what Mosiah is saying, and by doing that, begin to realize that it isn't quite what it sounds like at first glance. To do that, let's just start with the context of the chapter. Let's look at Mosiah 1. And now it came to pass that when King Benjamin had made an end of speaking the words which had been delivered unto him by the angel of the Lord, that he cast his eyes round about on the multitude, and behold, they had fallen to the earth, for the fear of the Lord had come upon them. Now, Benjamin has said several times before in, these, uh, uh, in this uh, sermon that the words that were given to him were given to him by an angel, that they're, he's saying directly what the angel has said. And whatever that was, and we'll look at it in a minute, but whatever that was, the angel says, uh, whatever the angel said, gave them a fear of the Lord. My first question then was, what does, what does that mean to have a fear of the Lord? I looked up the phrase in a number of places. And what I discovered was it does mean, as we often will say in our classes, it does mean reverence and awe. But as I looked at it, it also became clear in many instances it means genuine fear. They, these people were afraid of something. With that in mind, I turned back to the previous chapter, trying again to establish a context, chapter 3, and I gave myself a brief outline of that chapter. In verses 3 through 5 of chapter 3, King Benjamin, uh, telling us the words of the angel, tells us that Christ is coming. That's not particularly frightening. In fact, it's probably joyful. In verses second, 6 through 7, he tells them, he's predicting the, coming of the first coming of the Savior. He tells them that Christ will live and suffer in the flesh. Again, uh, it's not necessarily a happy message to know that Christ will suffer, but it doesn't seem to be something that should make them fear. In verses 8 through 9, 
It said that he'll bring salvation. Here, we have not only have nothing frightening, we have a very joyful message. In verse 10, however, we begin to shift in the direction of something that may very well frighten. In 10, he, the angel's words are that Jesus will arise from the dead, and there, because of that, he, there will be a righteous judgment. In verse 11, we're told that Christ will atone for Adam's transgression and for the sins of those who have sinned ignorantly. And then in verse 12 through 18, we begin to get very uh, clearly the idea that there's something to be afraid of. In those verses, we hear that the Lord has sent prophets to preach woe to those who have rebelled, because without their repentance, they cannot be saved. If we are among those to whom the prophets are supposed to preach, those who need to be repent, then we may have something to fear. In verse 19, then the angel's words follow up by saying, the natural man is an enemy to God. We must put off the natural man and yield to the Holy Spirit. We must become saints. Now, reading through that, I began to get an idea of what it is that the people of King Benjamin understood uh, that made them to, be, to fear. But I then also wondered what it meant to become a saint. How do I become a saint? It says in verse 19, it happens through the atonement. It happens because we will become submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love. We're told in verses uh, 20 through 21 that the knowledge of the Lord will spread through the world, and when it does, only little children will be blameless. Again, we have another issue. I'm not, maybe perhaps I'm not really a saint because I can think of times when I'm not submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love. Verses 20 through 21 tell us that only little children will be blameless. I'm not blameless. The Lord has come to, uh, will come and uh, cause us to need to repent. In verse 22, it's specifically said that the people of King Benjamin are not blameless. At that point, I pretty well understand what it is that at the beginning of chapter 4, King Benjamin's people fear. They fear that they're not what they ought to be. They fear they've not been obedient. They fear that they have not lived as they ought. They fear that they've not repented. Because they have those fears, then when King Benjamin speaks, they have fallen to the earth. They are so afraid of the possibility of being judged by the Savior that they have fallen to the earth. Lest we begin to think that King Benjamin is dealing here with an unusual group, let's turn further back to Mosiah 1. Mosiah 1, chapter 11, shows us something that where Benjamin begins to talk to them. And there Benjamin says, and moreover, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the Lord land of Jerusalem. And this I do because they have been a diligent people in keeping the commandments of the Lord. We have an odd thing here. King Benjamin has said to his people, you're diligent, you keep the commandments. He's praised them for that. But the message of the angel is that these are people who are not blameless, and they are so afraid of the angel's message that they fall to the earth in fear. We have this contradiction then. Their diligence, obedience to the commandments is not enough. If we turn back to chapter 4 then, let's take a look at, at verse 2 to see what it is that the people, ha how, they, how they're thinking when they respond. Mosiah 4, 2. And they had viewed themselves in their own carnal state even less than the dust of the earth, and they all cried aloud with one voice, saying, O oh, have mercy, and apply the atoning blood of Christ, that we may for receive forgiveness of our sins, and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth, and all things who shall come down among the children of men. So in chapter 2, they see themselves as less than the dust of the earth. I, I think a comparable situation would be one in a state conference, where perhaps the visiting general authority or the state president praises the people of that congregation for their diligence in keeping the commandments. And nevertheless, they fall down in fear for their salvation, and they say, we are less than the dust of the earth. Have mercy. May the atoning blood of Jesus Christ apply. These people then have been diligent, but have not yet received remission of their sins. In verse 3, however, we see that happen. It came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins. 
and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ, who should come, according to the words which King Benjamin had spoken unto them. Once they recognized their carnal state in spite of their diligence, then they are able to receive that remission of their sins. What King Benjamin says in the rest of this chapter then has to be understood in this context. In the context of a prophet of the Lord speaking to a people who are diligent and obedient, who do the things they should, but who have until this point not recognized the necessity of relying upon the atonement, have not really asked for that reliance in their life, and who have just now received a remission of their sins even though perhaps some of them had been baptized many years ago. And so it's in that context that King Benjamin begins to speak. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. And King Benjamin again opened his mouth and began to speak unto them, saying, My friends and my brethren, my kindred and my people, I would again call your attention that ye may hear and understand the remainder of my words which I shall speak unto you. For behold, if the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you to a sense of your nothingness and your worthless and fallen state, and then King Benjamin interrupts himself. Remember what has happened. These are diligent people, obedient people, who have discovered that in spite of their obedience, they are less than the dust of the earth, and they have then received remission of, your, of their sins. Benjamin, after they've received this remission, says to them, I need to remind you of what you've just learned. I want to repeat that. I want to go back to it. And then he says in verse 5, assuming that this knowledge of the goodness of God has brought this understanding of nothingness to you, then he stops. He stops because he wants to say more about the first part, if the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you. What knowledge is he talking about? We see that knowledge in verses 6 through 10. Those verses then explain the first half of verse 5. There, that's where he says, I say unto you, if you have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience and his long suffering towards the children of men, and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world, that therefore salvation might come to him that should put his trust in the Lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith even unto the end of his life, I mean the life of the mortal body. Notice again, we still don't have the end of a sentence. This is still a very long, if this, but nothing else. Verse 7, he repeats. He's told us in verse 6 what knowledge he's talking about. In verse 7, he begins to speak more about what this knowledge is, about who it is that has this knowledge. I say that this is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, which ever were since the fall of Adam, or who are, or whoever shall be even unto the end of the world. Now, having mentioned who will receive salvation, now he talks more about salvation. And this is still in an aside. He's still stopping in the middle of another sentence to explain the various ideas. And this is the means whereby salvation cometh. There is none other salvation, save this which hath been spoken of. Neither there are there any conditions except the conditions whereby man can be saved, except the conditions which I have told you. And then he repeats the conditions that he's told them before. The conditions for salvation are given in verse 9. Believe in God. Believe that he is, and that he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believe that he has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and earth. Believe that man doth not comprehend all the things which the Lord God can, can comprehend. He continues in verse 10. And again, believe that ye must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourselves before God and ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive you. And now if you believe all these things, see that ye do them. Now, having in verses 6 through 10 expanded on this notion of if you've come to a knowledge of the goodness of God, explaining what that is, that that knowledge is a knowledge of the atonement and that those who are obedient, who accept the atonement, are those who will be saved explaining what the conditions of atonement are, that they are belief and repentance and hum humility. Having done that, he comes back again then to the second half of verse 5. He says in verse 11, And again I say unto you, as I have said before, that as ye have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, or if ye have known of his goodness and have tasted of his love, in other words, if another way of saying this, if you've come to a knowledge of the glory of God, or in other words, if you have tasted of his love, 
and have received remission of, of your sins, which is something that, in fact, they have done. We saw that in, verse t in verses 2 and 3. So having received remission of their sins, he says, if this is true, a remission of the sins which causes such exceeding great joy in your souls, even so I would that you should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness and his goodness and long-suffering towards you, unworthy creatures, and humble yourselves even in the, depth of, in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and standing steadfastly in the faith of that which was, is to come, which was spoken of by the mouth of the angel. So verse 11 takes us back to verse 5. It says, if you have come to an understanding of your relative worthlessness, of the fact that you depend upon God, that means an understanding of the atonement, the necessity of, of repentance, the conditions for salvation. If you have those things and you've received a remission, a remission of your sins, don't forget them. You are unworthy, that's why, he says, that's why you need the atonement. And so verse 11 is really just picking up on verse 5. Now, once he's done that, then he begins to give them the blessing that, received, that comes. In verse 12, And behold, I say unto you that if ye do this, now what's the this? The this goes back to verse 11. If ye remember and retain in remembrance the, remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness, if you remember what it is that the fa our Father in heaven through his Son Jesus Christ can do for us, and the necessity we have of receiving that atonement and being diligent, that's his greatness and our nothingness, I say unto you that if ye do this, ye shall always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of your sins, and ye shall grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created you or in the knowledge of that which is just and true. Very frequently, we end our understanding of what happens in this sermon at that point. But notice something very interesting about verse 13. Verse 13 begins with the word and. Verse 13 says, you will not have a mind to injure one another. But to say that is to say that is one of the blessings that is received. If you do this, you will rejoice. You will be filled with the love of God. You will retain a remission of your sins. You will grow in knowledge. And you will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably. That end becomes a key then to us understanding that the blessing that follows from receiving remission of our sins does not end just with having peace in our hearts. It, it continues in verse 13 with the peace with one another. It continues, e continues even in verse 14 and 15. And ye will not suffer ch your children that they go hungry. So the connective word here is one that forces us to see, if we look carefully at it, that these are not commandments that follow, but blessings that follow upon the re uh, reception of remission of our sins. If we remember the greatness of God and are diligent, if we are uh, humble and we remember our own nothingness so that we rely on the atonement, then these things will follow from doing that. Now, whether these are blessings or commandments is is, I suppose, a moot point. It would be a strange thing, I think, to believe that the commandments are not blessings or that the reception of a blessing isn't, in a very real sense, the fulfillment of a commandment. It's an artificial distinction that we make between these. But the Lord here, speaking through his prophet, speaks of these things, living peaceably, having good family relations, as blessings that follow on our repentance, on our life with Christ in humility. Verses 14 and 15 tell us that you will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked, but you will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. These then are blessings. The, what follows after that continue to be these blessings or commandments, whichever way you prefer to take them, the things that follow upon our having received a remission of our sins, our having remembered the greatness of God and remembered our own nothingness. It's part of our diligence, I, I think, that we're being shown here. We will, for example, in 16, ye, and also ye yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor. You will administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need, and you will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and turn him out to perish. Not only will we take care of those who are members of our family, not only will we remember, uh, receive remission of our sins, we will also give to those who stand in need of giving. 
we are all, we're told that there are all sorts of excuses we could give. In verse 17, perhaps thou shalt say, the man has brought upon himself this misery. Therefore, I will stay my hand and will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him of my substance that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. And in verse 18, however, King Benjamin responds to this argument. I say unto you, O man, whosoever doeth this, the same hath great cause to repent. If we do that, then we no longer are in the position with, in which we began. We're no longer those who have received remission of our sins, remembered the Lord's greatness and our own nothingness. We're no longer those who are diligent. Why? Verse 19. Behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being, even God? We depend upon God. That's part of what it means that we are nothing. Therefore, we are obligated by that dependence and by the blessings that he's given us to assist those who depend upon us, whether those people are our children or whether those people are someone else. He tells us in 19 that we depend on him for everything. And in verse 20, he reminds the people he's speaking to of the situation in which they are in right now. He says, And behold, even at this time you have been calling on his name and begging for a remission of your sins. He not only reminds them of the parallel between them and the beggars, who they perhaps have been refusing. By doing this, he reminds them of the conditions that he has spoken of that they must remember. They must remember God's greatness and their nothingness. But remembering their nothingness is not a matter of some kind of breast beating or bad self-image. It's a matter of remembering the things they must do. It's a receiving remission of their sins and remembering to care for those who need care, children or others. He continues discussing this problem for several verses, up through verse 26. Given the, that he speaks of uh, family relations for only two verses and caring for the poor for about uh, 10 or 11 verses, I suspect that uh, this is a problem to which the people of King Benjamin had not been sufficiently diligent. They had not been caring for the poor as they ought. But notice his reminder here is a reminder by reminding them of their necessity and it's only a reminder that follows their remission of sins. And he speaks of it there as a blessing. If they have received this remission of sins, they will be blessed to be able to do these things, to share with those who are poor. In verse 27 then, King Benjamin says something to perhaps keep them from going too far with their pendulum one way or the other. He says, And see that all these things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength, and again, it is expedient that he should be diligent, that thereby he might win the prize, and therefore all things must be done in order. Here, too, is, a, is commonly a place where we stop the sermon when we read this. We have, first of all, the remission of sins that's received. Then we have King Benjamin's reminder of those conditions for receiving that remission of sins, remembering God's goodness, remembering our own nothingness. Then we have a list of the blessings that follow from that remembrance. Namely, we are blessed with the remission of sins, and we're blessed to be able to care for those who are in need. And then the, re the proviso at the end, what seems to be the end in verse 27, that all these things be done in order. Oddly enough, however, the sermon does not end there. The last, two ver last three or four verses are strange to us. Having given this powerful sermon, notice in verse 28 what Benjamin says. And I would that ye should remember that whosoever among you borroweth of his neighbor should return the thing that he borroweth, according as, uh, as he doth agree, or else thou shalt commit sin, and perhaps thou shalt cause thy neighbor to commit sin also. Now, King Benjamin brings up a very ordinary case. Having talked about all these wonderful things, he turns at the very end of his sermon to a fairly straightforward thing. I borrowed a rake from the neighbor and I forgot to return it or I didn't bother to return it. When I first was struck by the oddness of this, I really couldn't understand why it was there. Why wasn't it earlier? Why was it there at all? I, I went through a number of possibilities. I don't have a definitive answer, but it strikes me that it's an interesting way for him to end, partly because it is so ordinary. There's a temptation when we are in church listening to someone speak, especially if it's a powerful speaker, especially if the Spirit is there. There's a temptation for us to believe that we're talking about things that are so out of the ordinary that then it's, it's easier for us to go back to our daily existence and not to worry too much about what this has to do with borrowing a rake from the neighbor. 
King Benjamin delivers this powerful sermon where he talks about the atonement, where he talks about the conditions for repentance, where he talks about receiving remission of our sins, where he then talks about the necessity of supporting our families, of contributing to the welfare projects of the church, and then ends with not with some stirring call as we might be tempted to, to all go out and, and do the right thing, but with a call to go out and return the things we've borrowed. Finally, then he says, I cannot, in verse 29, I cannot tell you all the things whereby you may commit sin, for there are divers ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives, ye must perish. And now a man remember and perish not. King Benjamin ends, having given this, this uh, wonderful sermon, he ends uh, with two pieces of homely advice. One of them is return what you, owe, you, you have borrowed. The other is don't expect it for me to give you a list of the kinds of things that you could have done wrong. I've mentioned things here. You could have uh, not taken care of your children. You could have not helped out in the welfare of those who are not in your families. Uh, but that's, that's just a short list. What you must do, he says, uh, he, he says, is remember. You have to watch yourselves. You have to be obedient. But memory has been a part of this from the beginning. We are to remember the Lord's greatness and our nothingness. We are to remember that we have received a remission of sins. We are to remember the commandments. This verse 30, then, is another way of saying what's been be, what King Benjamin has, be, has been saying all along. If we remember what the Lord has offered and why we are dependent upon him, we will have the Holy Ghost, we will be diligent to the end, we will do the things that we have been required to do. There is much to be gained from Mosiah. There is much to be gained from King Benjamin's address. There is much to be gained from verses 6 through 10 of, of Mosiah 4. But what's to be gained is to be gained by careful and, and, and uh, diligent study. There, some of the things that I hope you've been able to see is the importance of considering the context, of knowing what the words mean, of using these scriptures to find out what the scriptures mean, cross-referencing, looking at what the prophets are referring to, of understanding how particular words like and and therefore tie pieces of, of Scripture together and, and give us an understanding of what's going on, of the importance of asking questions about what we read and looking to the Scriptures for answers to, to those questions. My experience has been that by doing this, I get much more out of Scripture study. I don't always study this way. There are times when I read through the Book of Mormon from cover to cover. There are other times when I may spend an hour on only a few verses. Part of that is dictated by the needs of the, of the moment. Part of that is dictated by the necessity of reading through the scriptures as a whole occasionally so that I have the big picture. But I try to spend a good deal of my time reading carefully in small amounts to understand carefully what the Lord has told me. The result in my life has been that the scriptures have become a very important part of my life. They answer many questions. They give me guidance and direction. I discovered that the Lord has told me many things he would have me know without my having to get some other revelation. The revelation has already been given. My testimony is that careful study of the scriptures will increase the, the spirit in our lives, will increase our ability to remember the things of, that the Lord has told us. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> For more information about the Book of Mormon and other related topics, call 1-800-327-6715.